Hello, my children. Father Dan here for Exorcist Club Part 2. That's right. Dose. Dose. Uh, we are reading the book, The Exorcist. For this session, you must have read the second book within the series. Uh, there's, there's four parts in this. It's called The Edge, and there are six chapters. So you should have read those six, cha six chapters within The Edge section. Now, uh, before we get started, we're gonna we're gonna take a little sip of Father Dan's medicine, and then we're gonna we're gonna do the Lord's Prayer to bless us while we're talking about these demonic entities. We want to we want to bless this space. All right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna bless this space. All right, everybody, I want you to I want you to close your eyes and I want you to bow your heads in prayer. Here we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. All right, kids. That was great. That was great. I, I do have a little graphic that I met, I didn't put up. I got a little graphic here for you. I, I recommend all of you to learn this prayer. This is a very effective prayer. Uh, if you are ever in the presence of malevolent demonic entities, this prayer can help you. I highly recommend you memorize it, utilize it. All right. Amen. Thank you, everyone in the chat. Amen. Yes, yes, I love it. I love it. I love to see this enthusiasm here. I love to see this enthusiasm here. All right. So, uh, so we start book two, The Edge. And before this part of the book begins, we have a, another uh, lead-in quote, which says, In our sleep, pain, which cannot forget, falls drop by drop upon the heart, until in our own despair... Against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. This is from Aeschylus. This is an ancient Greek man who is known as the father of tragedy. He wrote many tragedies. And interestingly enough, Robert Kennedy quoted this poem uh, in his address to a crowd in Indianapolis after Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. He used this quote in his speech to the people, telling everyone, I understand uh, a lot of people are going to have real dark feelings about this, but instead of continuing to, to polarize and segregate ourselves, instead we should come together. We should find some con to, some togetherness. So uh, so I think we got, a, we got another quote here about senseless tragedies and how we can you know, ask for grace during these moments find some wisdom you know it's not just for nothing suffering isn't for nothing it happens for a reason all right so let's go to chapter one so speaking of grief uh, this is our grief chapter for father Damien Karras we learned in our last session that his mother had died and so now we get to see the aftermath of that uh, we we see him bury his mother he returns to Georgetown and uh He's obviously broken up. He's in the depths of despair. He was already questioning his faith. This has not helped anything for him. Uh, Father Dyer, who was at the party, Chris McNeil's party, he shows up. He's got a bottle of Chivas Regal, and uh, he's pretending that he stole it because the Jesuit priests, they, have a, um, they take a vow of poverty, so they don't have any money. <laughs> so he's like how do you have this nice booze <laughs> like well, how did you get this dude and he's like i stole it from the president I stole it from the president of the college and he's he is uh he's lying because the college president actually gave him the nice booze to go share with karis but he didn't want to be overt about his actions so they kind of concocted this story karis knows this but goes along with it and uh they get drunk you know, I, I love Father Dyer and, and Karis together. They're such a great team. Uh, and he gets he gets super hammered, as one usually does when someone close to them has died. 
And he has a sad nightmare about his frightened mother searching for him. She comes out of the subway and, you know, she's looking for him and he sees her and he's trying to wave to her, but she can't see him back. And she descends, you know, kind of frightened back into the subway. And uh, he wakes up from this terrible nightmare and he has to go serve mass. And he's thinking while he's serving mass, uh, thinking about how what happened, you know, in the last few months and how she has she was checked into Bellevue by her brothers uh, before her death. She was locked in this terrible padded cell. She was raving. I mean, she had kind of lost it. And he went to go see her. And when she sees him through the window, he, she comes up and she says, why you do this to me, Demi? Why? You know, this is this is a very iconic. <laughs> it's a very iconic. And when you watch the movie, this is a very iconic fucking line. Um, and I mean, oh, my God, what guilt, you know, what guilt? He doesn't have the money, the vow of poverty. He doesn't have the money to put his mother in a nice hospital. So she's got to go to this fucking madhouse. And uh, while he's praying, he prays that there's also someone to hear his prayer, but he not, does not believe that there is. Later, after mass, he's hanging out in his cottage being sad. And a young priest knocks on his door because he's the resident psychiatrist and the priest comes in and uh, needs some help, you know, is having an issue, which is like, oh, the worst time. I mean, this guy is this guy is giving from an empty cup, you know, like he, he has nothing to give. And yet here he is listening to somebody else's fucking problems, which is the last thing that he wants to do. He has no fucking he's got he's got nothing to give, but yet he's continuing to give. Uh, and he says in the from the book, it says in the eyes of restless burden. In the eyes, the restless burden, in the voice, the tugging plea. For an instant, Karis hated him. This guy comes to his door. Karis is like, fuck. Come in. Come in, he said gently and inwardly, raged at this portion of his being that so frequently rendered him helpless in the face of someone's plea that he could not control, that lay coiled within him like a length of rope, always ready to fling itself out to rescue the call of somebody else's need. It gave him no peace, you know, and that's, that's the burden of a healer. That is the burden of a healer. You want to help people. But again, like I said, you can't, you can't give from an empty cup. And yet we, so many of us do, you know, so many of us do all the time. I've definitely, I really uh, identified with Karis in this moment because there's definitely been times where I just have nothing. And a friend of mine, you know, is in a tough spot space and and they want to they need someone to talk to and I just I'm so fucking tired and I don't really want to hear it but I do it anyways because acts of service that's what you do for the ones you love you know you fucking you listen to their bullshit so this guy comes in he's talking about the terrible the terrible loneliness of priests how they're cut off from family they're cut off from women uh, but how they're also fearful of expressing affection for fellow priests of forming deep loving relationships the younger priest says to him, I'd like to put my arm around another guy's shoulder, but right away I'm scared he's going to think I'm queer, so I just don't do it. You know, I just don't do it. And like, oh, this this really spoke to me as well. I mean, this is something I'm not a, I'm, <laughs> I mean, I'm a priest right now, but uh, I haven't always been a priest. And I felt a terrible weight of loneliness where you just, you, you just want to have physical contact. You just want to touch someone. You want to just put your arm around somebody, throw your legs over someone. Just have this this physical intimacy that isn't sexual. It's just hanging out with another human being. But after puberty, you know, you get to this point where any physical contact with another adult, like there's always this undercurrent of sexuality. You know, are we going to fuck? He touched me. She touched me. Ah, oh, is this, ah, oh, what's going on? Do I want to fuck this person? It's like it's like when you're, you know, when you're a kid, you're hanging out with your friends. You don't think about it. You just throw your legs over them on the couch. It's not a big deal. Nobody thinks about it. Nobody cares. You're kids. But then when you get older, everything changes and you're cut off from your fellow humans. You can't just have physical intimacy with people that aren't sexually attached to you, you know? And and what a what a how sad that is. You know, I I really I do miss physical intimacy. Uh that's that's non-sexual in nature. You know, it's something that's that's fucking it's real. Uh, and so Karis felt the weight shifting slowly from the younger priest onto him. He let it come and he let him talk. Uh, and so, you know, he's, this is, this is called psychic transference. You know, when you're listening to someone and their problems, they really do shift their burdens onto you and you do in fact lighten their load. You know, that's a real thing. And that's something that we all need to think about 
when we're having a moment, when we're talking to somebody else, sometimes it's good to ask someone if you're preparing to vent, and I know I'm guilty of this as well, uh, of saying, hey, do you have the emotional capacity to, to, to listen to this right now? Do, can you, do you have the energy to, to listen to this? Because it is psychic vampirism telling someone your problems, you know, and sometimes we don't have the energy to listen to it. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, I'm going to try this as well in the future before I vent on some motherfucker, you know, I'm going to try to take a moment and say, hey, I, I need, I need to vent. Do you, are you in a place, you know, is your cup full? Can, can I, can I talk to you or are you on empty right now? Because if not, I don't want to fucking, I don't want to do this to you. Um, but he allows him to become his friend in hopes that the dude will go on and make real friends of his own. So, he starts a little book club with him. He gives the priest, you know, a book. And he's like, hey, you know, read this book. I'd love to know your thoughts on it. He doesn't fucking care. He does not want to be friends with this fucking guy. But he is trying to heal him and he is trying to help him. Uh, yes, Evil Dead Tim, they are reading Shadows. <laughs> uh, and so, and then the guy leaves. Then an older priest comes in. He's talking about there's a new desecration in the church. Okay, last time. There was a, a phallus sculpted on Jesus, and there was uh, defecation on the altar, on the altar cloth. Now, Mary has been painted to look like a harlot. And also, there's a typewritten sheet in fluent Latin describing a homosexual encounter between Mary Magdalene and the Virgin Mary. Uh, and he's, you know, since Karis is the psychiatrist of the fucking, of the Jesuits, this guy's like, is it? Is it a sick priest? Would you tell me if it's a sick priest? Because, like, this seems like some fucking sicko priest is doing this. Like, would you know anyone? And he's like, I, I don't, I'm sorry. Like, I don't, I don't know anybody that fits this description. But he may not even know he's doing it. Maybe it's somebody who's, you know, doing this in their sleep. I don't fucking know, you know. And so the, the older priest leaves. And Karis is finally relieved of his duties as a counselor and assigned to Georgetown University Medical School as a lecturer in psychiatry. And he is under strict orders to rest. He's under orders to rest. Thank, praise Jesus, because this man needs a break, okay? Like, I need a break. Father Karis needs a break. We all need a break. It's been a rough year. And I'm so happy for this man. I'm so happy for this man that he got a little break and got it said to not have to listen to people's fucking problems anymore. Because he's getting ready to snap, okay? He's getting ready to fucking snap. I see it. I feel it. I've been there. So let's go on to chapter two. Uh, so we got Reagan. We're going to switch We're gonna switch from Damien Karras to Reagan and Chris. She's back at the doctor's office. They have no idea what the fuck. She's hearing things. She's smelling things. They're thinking maybe it's the temporal lobe. They're giving her more tests. They gave her an EEG. They torture this poor girl. Uh, you know, they come up with nothing. They're like, maybe it's epilepsy. I don't know. They go back to the temporal lobe lesion. They keep thinking it's some weird lesion on her brain. Uh, and they talk about how people who had temporal lobe lesions in the past were considered to be possessed by the devil. They give her more drugs, uh, more tests, x-rays. Uh, we find out that Reagan did eventually talk to her dad. He called for her birthday, and he says to Chris that he called her a, called him a cocksucker, and then hung up on him. And Chris, now they're they're you know bearing down on Chris like, hey, you know, you got to direct this if you want to direct this thing. You know, she wants to be a director. She's got this shot, this opportunity. They're like, you got to get ready now. And she's like, I've got a sick kid. I I need to stall. I don't think I can do this. Uh, Mary Jo, the psychic who is at the party, she sends a book along. It's a, it's a witchcraft book, a study of devil worshiper and related occult phenomenon. But the next morning, the book was gone and nobody noticed. Nobody noticed. But yeah, uh, pumping her full of drugs. I know they just they just keep giving her drugs. You know, they just keep giving her new drugs. They keep torturing her. There's an Alan Watts thing talking about how... Uh, you know, beware of virtue. He talks about bewaring of virtue and that in the past there were people, you know, within the church to prevent people's souls from going to hell. You know, they thought that they were really doing a service, that they would do these terrible things to people. You know, they would do terrible things in the name of this virtue that they were, you know, like, oh, well, it's OK to torture someone if you if you get their their soul to heaven. And he talks about how now 
uh, within the medical community. You know, it's like, oh, you know, these doctors, like, we were going to heal you. We're going to make you feel better. And they do all of these terrible things to people and, like, torturous fucking things to people, all in the name of healing, which a lot of times doesn't even work. Uh, he talks about cancer being kind of like a, a cool way to die. You know, he's like, hey, like, it's not the worst way to go. You've got time to get your affairs in order. Mostly you've got time to say goodbye to everybody and how, you know, maybe getting chemotherapy and doing all those things like and wasting the last of your years being tortured and, and having to fucking take all this terrible medicine and make yourself feel sick. Maybe that's not the best way to go, you know, which is interesting thought. I really, I like this thought. It's, it's an interesting, it's guy, I'm like, oh, this is very subversive, Alan Watts. Tell me more. Let's go to chapter three. Uh, Jimmy Nail says, I was born with brain damage. I've been through all those machines. They're frightening. Yeah, I'll tell you what. All these medical tests certainly aren't helping the fucking situation. You know, like these are not helping Reagan. These are terrible things for her and the condition that she's in. It's only making things worse. It's only adding to the problem for this young girl. Uh, <laughs> Blue-eyed ginger southpaw. No one expects the Spanish Inquisition is a much darker joke for anyone who actually knows their history. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. Uh, so here we go. We're going to chapter three. Uh, we got more tests. Uh, neurologists, they find nothing in the x-rays. Uh, you know, we got a, we got a, um, these two doctors that are hanging out. They get a call from Chris. She's like, I need you guys to come over right now. Right now. There is some problems. They show up. They go upstairs. They see Reagan. She's essentially being, it looks as, as if by invisible hands, she's being lifted off the bed and thrown back down, you know, over and over again. Uh, uh, you know, uh, she's twisting. She's, you know, crossing and uncrossing her legs. She has a bulging throat. She's arching her back. She's saying these things like, no one my, uh, and saying things like, the sow is mine. Uh, just saying, fuck me, masturbating in front of everybody, calling herself, oh, my pearl, my child. She makes cat sounds, dog sounds, horse sounds, her fucking torsos whirling around. She's screaming, make him stop. I can't breathe. She's gibbering with cadence. Uh, arching like a bow until her head touches her feet. The doctors inject her with more drugs. They uh, they try a spinal tap this time. That sounds like a lot of fun. They give her a fucking spinal tap. And Chris relates the story of Captain Howdy chasing Reagan. Uh, she, she Reagan comes down one day and is hiding behind her saying Captain Howdy is chasing her. And then she collapses onto the floor in jerking spasms saying that he's kicking her. Then she starts spinning like a top, falls to the floor again, and then Chris sees these hate. Her face changes, and there's these hate in her eyes, and then she says something terrible to her. Um, they do the spinal. It brings up nothing. There's nothing in it. So they do more blood tests, nothing. And so finally, the internists are like, okay, maybe it's not a physical issue. Maybe we should start looking for a psychiatrist. So she goes with the docs. They're going to they're gonna test some, some sugar, some blood sugars. They're doing some other tests. Uh, she leaves Reagan with Sharon. Willie and Carl, the housekeepers, they're out uh, doing their thing. Sharon, they got to get Thorazine. They have to, like, have, you know, there's a prescription for, th for Thorazine now because that's how bad it's gotten. They really need to, like, dope this little kid up and just, like, make her pass the fuck out. And Sharon can't get them to deliver it. So Burke Dennings shows up. She leaves him with her, and she goes out to get the Thorazine. Uh, but Chris gets back home. No one's there. No one's no one's with Reagan. Uh, Reagan is asleep. Her window is wide open. Willie shows up. Then Sharon shows up with the medicine. She explains why well, I, I didn't leave her alone. I left her with Burke. You know, and she's like, well, Burke left. You know, and you shouldn't have fucking left him with that fucking trunk. <laughs> And Sharon, uh, Sharon and Chris, then they start practicing giving shots on grapefruit because now they got to fucking shoot up this little girl. So they're practicing giving shots. Carl shows up. Um, a call comes in. Burke's dead. Burke Dennings is now dead. He fell down the M Street steps, which is right outside their home, and broke his neck. Chris and Sharon stay up to reminisce about it. I mean, obviously, Chris is very shaken about this. And, uh, and creepiest scene alert... Whoa, I mean, this is this is a scene that isn't in the original movie that kind that is in the, you know, extended version of the movie. Uh, but it's even creepier in the book, the way that it is described. So Sharon is out. She's getting some ice. She's coming back into the study. And then there's Reagan. 
arched, arms back, like like arched like a spider, her tongue flicking in and out of her mouth. She's fucking snake doing her head like a fucking snake. And uh, she's following Sharon. And, like, because she's on the ground doing this weird fucking spider walk, you know, <laughs> like, this fucking psycho spider walk, uh, Sharon doesn't see her. She comes in, Chris sees what's going on, and is like, Sharon? Sharon turns around, doesn't see anything, but then feels Reagan's tongue on her ankle. And she screams. She screams, and she's like, oh, my God, and runs away. Uh, she jumps away, and uh, and then wherever Sharon moves, Reagan follows, you know? And it's just like, oh, God, like, what a nightmare. Like, what, what a fun... I mean, there's just... There's a lot of graphic scenes in this section, but... For me in particular, that scene, the spider walk and the, and the just, oh my God, it's a fucking nightmare. It's just, a, it's a fucking nightmare. Uh, but like I said, it's, it was cut from the original movie, but they do have her doing the spider walk down the stairs, you know, and it's like, it's fucking terrifying. Um, so let's go to chapter four. Uh, so we got the, the neuropsychiatrist is in the house. They're pumping Reagan with more drugs. You know, giving her more fucking drugs, sedating her. Uh, and she tells the doctor how Captain Howdy is inside her, making her do things. He tries hypnotism. He's like, hey, let us talk to the thing inside you. Will you let us talk to this fucking thing inside you? Uh, she's like, oh, that's not a great idea. But, you know, they push. And so she goes, okay, I'll let you fucking talk to him. And then as soon as, uh, as, soon as she does, her breath turns foul. I mean, everyone in the fucking room can smell it. Her expression changes. He asks, who are you? And again, uh, Reagan says, no one, my. And then, you're a man? Are you speaking in a foreign language? And he says, say, say. And if you're paying attention, uh, this demon exchange, everything that the demon is saying to this hypnotist is backwards. So no one, my is I am no one. Yes, who are you? I am no one. And then he's like, are you a man? Are you speaking in a foreign language? Say is yes. Backwards, he's saying yes. And then he's like, where do you come from? He says dog, which is God. And he's like, you, you come from a dog? And he says, dog morph motion, which means no, I, I come from God. And then he's like, you know, I don't know, what you're, I don't know what you're fucking saying. So we need to switch to yes or no. So I need you to nod your head. Yes and no. And we have a very, we have a very honest kind of demon here. Uh, let's read their exchange so he says uh did your answers have meaning he asked her yes are you someone whom reagan has known no that she knows of no are you someone she invented no you're real yes part of reagan no were you ever part of reagan no do you like her no dislike her yes do you hate her yes over something she's done yes do you blame her for her parents' divorce? No. Has it something to do with her parents? No. With a friend? No. But you hate her? Yes. Are you punishing Reagan? Yes. You wish to harm her? Yes. To kill her? Yes. If she died, wouldn't you die too? No. Is there something she can do that would make you leave her? Yes. Can you tell me what it is? Yes. Will you tell me? No. <laughs> and it's, it's, I mean, everything is pretty true, you know, like that's fucking, that's like, okay, he's being pretty honest with the guy. Uh, and then Reagan goes and squeezes the guy's fuck, grabs the guy's balls, squeezes his scrotum like real fucking hard. Uh, it's total pandemonium. Uh, the two doctors are struggling with her. Uh, it's just, it's a whole, it's, it's, it's a tangle of doctors, animal noises, screams. They're trying to inject her with more drugs. She passes the fuck out. They all go downstairs. They're talking. It is a split personality. The doctor tells her, we use concepts like consciousness, mind, personality, but we really don't know yet what they are. So when I started talking about something, so when I start talking about someone like something like multiple or split personalities, all we have are some theories that raise more questions than they give answers. Freud thought that certain ideas are feelings uh, are somehow repressed by the conscious mind but remain alive in a person's subconscious, remain quite strong, in fact, 
and continue to seek expression through various psychiatric symptoms. Now, when this repressed or let's call it dissociated material is sufficiently strong or where the subject's personality is disorganized and weak, it's been known at times to function independently as a separate personality. They also go in, they say hysteria over guilt, maybe over the divorce, uh, thanatophobia, maybe it's a fear of death, maybe there's some somnambulatism. Uh, they recommend she goes to the Behringer Clinic in Dayton, Ohio for two to three weeks of study. So really, again, they, they don't know what the fuck, you know, and that, that is something that's interesting is like we use concepts like consciousness, mind and personality, but we really don't know what they are yet. And that's true. You know, science doesn't understand consciousness. It is a giant mystery. We don't really know what it is. You know, we don't really know what the fuck is going on. Uh, so they're packing up for a trip. Lieutenant F. Kinderman shows up. William F. Kinderman. I love Kinderman. He is the main protagonist of the next novel, Legion. Uh, and he shows up with some questions about Burke Denning's death. So this man is investigating a possible homicide. Uh, I like when they're ta- when he's talking to Chris McNeil. He says, the world, the entire world seems to be having a massive nervous breakdown. I think about that right now. I'm like, is that what's going on now, too? <laughs> seems a little fucking weird. Uh, I'll rock one. Demons are notoriously honest. They are. I feel like demons are generally pretty honest. I mean, they'll mix, but they'll mix lies with the truth. You know, they'll like twist the truth. Like they like to use the truth. You know, they like to really fuck with you. Um, But so while he's there, yeah, the collective unconscious is tripping. That's right, Cornelius J. It is. It's fucking, it's a wild, it's a wild fucking year this year. Uh, just, oh my God, neurosis is just like out of control. I mean, like the fucking suicides and homicides that are like going down right now. It's just like, whoa, like this is not fucking chill. Um, but anyways, while Kinderman finds, he finds out while he's there that Burke was there the night that he died, left alone with Reagan, supposedly no one else in the house. She was sedated. Uh, her bedroom has that massive window over the M street stairs and uh and it's interesting too carl the handyman he's like polishing the oven in the background he's just like she's like polishing the oven even though chris is like he just polished the oven he doesn't even be polishing the oven but really he's there he's just like listening to the conversation because he wants to know what this fucking cop is talking to her about uh and then carl answers questions about his whereabouts he says he went to a movie and then it took a bus home um and then uh so while he's there he sees kinderman sees this little bird statue by reagan you know he's commenting on it he's a sly devil <laughs> he's a sly he's a sly man he picks it up he uh, he takes a little paint sample off his thumb you know he scrapes scrapes a little paint off that bitch uh he goes to leave and he thinks he sees a figure in reagan's window you know he thinks he sees someone it's like you know chris is telling him oh she's sedated she's really sick you know she's she can't get up out of bed right now and yet when he's going downstairs it's like somebody's fucking up there like somebody's in that window uh he goes back to work on the case he checks up on carl he sees that there's a felony charge for allegedly stealing a quantity of narcotics over a period of time from a home of a Beverly Hills doctor where he was employed, but the charges were dropped. No drugs were found in his system, and the doctor ended up giving a good reference, even though they parted ways. And then he started working for Chris McNeil. So what's going on? Something, something fishy's going on with Carl. Uh, then he thinks about the recent desecrations. He reads up on Black Mass. Uh, he goes to the morgue, and he goes to see Denning's body, where we find out that, that Burke Denning's head has been completely <laughs> turned around. All right, it's it's all it's all the way around. It's all the way around here. Um, but let's take a moment. Let's take a moment to talk about the Black Mass. We were talking about that last time. So Kinderman is reading about it. it. Says Black Mass, a form of devil worship, the ritual consisting in the main of one, the sermon, to performance of evil among the community, two, coition with the demon. Reputedly painful, the demon's penis invariably described as icy cold, which, by the way, I was reading in another occult book. It was saying that, you know, people like when witches copulate like with the devil at like a, at a you know, ritual or a black mass or whatever, they do say that his dick is icy cold. So maybe, maybe the priests are fucking these women or whoever with like a fake you know, like with like a like a dildo or something that like that's not them because they're not really interested in copulation. They're just interested in getting the sexual energy so that they can like focus it somewhere. You know, they don't want the actual release. 
Uh, and so maybe that's why there's reported of icy icy cold penises in these in these rituals uh, anyways a variety of desecrations that were largely sexual in nature for example communion hosts of unusual size were prepared compounded of flour feces menstrual blood and pus which then were slit and used as artificial vaginas with which the priests would ferociously copulate while uh, raving that they were ravishing the Virgin Mother of God or that they were sodomizing Christ. In another instance of such practice, a statue of Christ was inverted or inserted deep in a girl's vagina while into her anus was inserted the host while the priest then crushed as he shouted blasphemies and sodomized the girl. Life-size images of Christ and the Virgin Mary also played a frequent role in the ritual. The image of the Virgin, for example, usually painted to give her a dissolute, sluttish appearance was equipped with breasts which the cultists sucked and also a vagina into which the penis might be inserted. The statues of Christ were equipped with a phallus for fellatio by both the men and the women and also for insertion into the vagina of a woman or the anus of the men. Occasionally, rather than an image, a human figure was bound to a cross and made to function in place of the statue and upon the discharge of his semen it was collected in the blasphemously consecrated chalice and used in the making of the communion host, which was destined to be consecrated on an altar covered with excrement. That's black mass. So we were, we were asking about it. We were asking about it last week. There you go. There's what Kinderman was, was reading about there. Um, so let's go on to chapter five. <laughs> so in chapter five, I know nothing worse than a cold penis. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not preferable. Uh, although, I mean, there are, there are those glass dildos that you can put in the freezer or you can put them in the microwave and you can get whatever, whatever temperature you're looking for. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so we go on to chapter five and this is actually one of my favorite chapters of the book thus far. I really like this chapter. This is Kinderman and Karis. So these two men finally meet up. They have not met before. Um, Karis is out. He's working out. You know, he's trying to he's trying to get his aggression out through through just tiring himself out physically. You know, just just fucking running the track. You know, so he can just pass the fuck out. And uh, and so it's funny too. I love that Karis is wearing a shirt that says "Philosophers." And later on, we find out that was a part of a lower class baseball team. And the upper class was the theologians. You know, <laughs> which I was like, I like that the upper class was the theologians and the lower class were the philosophers. Um. Anyways, so. Kinderman is is feigning ignorance, you know, acting like this bumbling guy who doesn't know what the fuck. And Karis immediately calls him on it. He sees through this facade, you know. He's like, "I know you're smart. You don't need to act like you're stupid with me. Like I'm I'm not stupid, so you don't need to act like you're fucking stupid." Uh, these two men are both on each other's level. You know, they're both highly intelligent people, and Karis is able to read him just as Kinderman is able to read other people. So he cuts to the chase. And uh, essentially, Kinderman is picking Karis's brain, you know, about this case. He's like, there's a lot of weird shit going on here. Uh, and he says, you know, there's these desecrations at the church. But maybe this recent murder of Burke Dennings is tied in. Uh, maybe there's a, a connection. You've got the black mass, you know, situation going on at the church, these desecrations. Then you got, you got this guy with his head turned around. And apparently that is something that a demonic assassin would do. This is something that maybe a witch who had, who had spilled secrets of the coven, they would find them with their heads turned all the way around, you know? So he's like, is it a sick priest? Again, it's like Karis gets this again. Is it a sick priest? You're the psychiatrist. You'd fucking know. Like, is this some fucking freak? You need to tell me about some fucking freak. Do you know who the fuck this is? And Karis again is like, I don't know anyone who fits this description. And if I did, I would, I wouldn't tell you his name, but I would let you know, you know, I would tell you there's a sick freak, but I wouldn't know. I wouldn't tell you who he was. And I love when Karis or uh, when Kinderman is like, Hey, I'm just telling you this for funsies, you know, uh, there was there was a psychiatrist in California who got jailed for not telling the cops what he knew, you know, and he's like, well, that's cute because I could just tell a judge that this was a matter of confession. So you can go fuck yourself right now. He's like, hey, father paranoia. I'm just bringing it up for fun. I'm just bringing it up for fun. Uh, but he's like, but no, I'm not covering. I'm not I'm not covering. Like, I'm just I'm letting you know, like, I'm not covering for anybody right now. 
nobody I know fits this fucking description. Kinderman goes on to ask him, is there a, a witch coven? Do you think there's a witch coven here? And Karis defensively says, oh, come on. You know, he doesn't say no. And uh, Kinderman, like, picks up on that right away. He's like, oh, you didn't say no. But instead, you are a smart ass again. That's defensive. You're afraid you'll look gullible, maybe. A superstitious priest in front of Kinderman, the rationalist. The age of reason made flesh and now walking beside you. <laughs> I love that he called him a rationalist. The age of reason made flesh and now walking beside him. I, lo I love their repartee. These two, these two cuties are really fun. Uh, Karis goes on to tell him that the center of Satan worship in Europe is in Turin, Italy. And he thinks that, yes, there is, in fact, black mass, that it is real. It is done. Uh, but it is done by disturbed individuals who can't have any sexual pleasure unless it's connected to a blasphemous action. So it's less about them being actual Satanists. And more about them having a weird sexual hang-up where they can't get off unless it's blasphemous. And so this is kind of an excuse for them. So he's like, yes, I think that there is black mass, but I don't think it's actual Satanism going on. I think it's more about these disturbed people who have these sexual fucking hang-ups. Uh, and then he also, so they start talking about people who use the blood of newborn babies for unholy communion wine. They talk about evil midwives murdering babies for that use. And this is why European Catholics had a prejudice against midwives, which was really interesting. They talk about this one lady who admitted to killing 30 to 40 babies, making them appear as if they were stillborn when they were not. She had a little needle. She had a really thin needle. And when a baby was born, she would stick it in their head, you know, and then pull it out. And there was no mark because it was such a thin needle. And so it would make the babies appear as if they were stillborn, and then she could use them for black mass. Um, but again, you know, Karis is like, hey, most of these confessions were committed under torture. So you can't really take them too seriously. Who knows if these people are just saying what the fuck that these other people wanted them to hear. Um, and, uh, and so he, and he's like, well, what about other, you know, what are other reasons that someone might confess to this? Kinderman asks him and he's like, well, maybe crazy people that are just crazy and they just confess to things that they didn't do. You know, there's also that possibility. And, uh, you know, he's playing devil's advocate. And Kinderman says, one thing we sometimes tend to forget is that people psychotic enough to confess to such things might actually be psychotic enough to have done them. And then tells him of a werewolf case where there was a man who believed he was a werewolf and he would go out in the full moon and he would kill children. And when they found him, Karis is like, is this true? Are you full of shit right now? He's like, no, I'm pretty sure it's true. Cause when they found him, he was eating the brains of his like two fucking stepdaughters. So I think, I think in this case, you know, this guy who confessed to being a werewolf was in fact fucking doing crazy shit. Uh, and then he's like, hey, let me drive you home. Let me drive. This has been a great conversation. Let me drive you home. And I really, I loved this part where Kinderman's like, you know what? I get free passes to the movie. Do you like the movies? I like the movies. And you know what? I love, I, but my wife, she falls asleep. She falls asleep so early and I hate to go to the movies alone. And afterwards, I just, I love to talk about film, to discuss, to critique. And then he goes on to say, would you like to see a film with me sometime? It's free. He asked him on a bro date. He's like, you're smart. I like you. I want I, I love that he knows. And it's like, I love that Kinderman knows what he likes to do. You know, he's a man who, who knows the simple pleasures in his life. He likes to go to the movies. He likes to go with somebody. And he likes to talk with that somebody after the film. I get it. I'm the same. <laughs> I, get, I mean, I'll go to a movie by myself. I don't have to go with somebody. But it is more fun when you get to go with somebody who is smart and interesting. And you can talk with them about the film afterwards and have a good time. Uh, and so he asked him on a bro date and Karis is like, yeah, I'll, I'll fucking, I'll do it. I'll go with you. You know, I'll fucking go with you. Um, <laughs> limited knowledge. We can even sit next to each other. No funny business, you know, but it's, it's so funny how the other priest, you know, he was so afraid to like become friends with somebody, you know, and here's Karis like already just befriending this cop, like out of nowhere. And this cop's being like, Hey, let's be bros. And he's just like, yeah, cool. You know, this guy, this guy, like, Kinderman's on the level of Karis. The, the young priest, he's not on level. Karis doesn't want to be friends with him. He's not on the level. But Kinderman, he's like, yeah, I'll go to the movie with you. Um, so anyways, uh, and before they part ways, uh, Karis gives Kinderman the Latin, the Latin card 
that the that they found at the desecrated church that had the the lesbian fucking Latin <laughs> scenario written on it. And uh, and he does ask him, you know, he says, well, whoever wrote this, Kara says, whoever wrote this can think in Latin. Like, I mean, this is written really well. And he's like, well, who can think in Latin? You know, who can do that? And he's like, well, priests kind of can. There comes a point in our training when we do. Our philosophical courses are taught in Latin for precision of thought. It expresses nuances and subtle distinctions that English can't handle. I love that. Oof. That made me want that. That alone made me want to. I've always wanted to learn Latin. I've always wanted to learn Latin. You know, I feel like that would give me a real edge in the world learning Latin and that. And that alone, I was like, oh, yeah, I need to learn Latin. I need to. I need to take like a little online class or something. I need to get on that. Uh, so, anyways, Karis goes to dinner. They part ways. Karis goes to dinner. He sits with Father Dyer, and uh, he's hanging out with Dyer, who's like a fun, fun guy. You know, he's a little bit of cut up. And unfortunately. Ugh, uh that young priest comes up is like well i finally read that book you know and pulls up a chair karis glanced up and felt instant dismay felt the soft crushing weight the press of lead the press of bone as he recognized the young priest who had come to him recently oh and what did you think of it karis asked as if with interest <laughs> we've all been there We've all been there, guys. Like, again, I just, I just fucking, like, get out. Like, I don't really, oh, like, fuck, I'm trying to be nice. And fuck, I gotta act like I give a shit. I gotta act like I fucking give a shit. And this sucks, but I'm gonna do it because, because uh, I'm a good person, you know. Um, but he does end up asking the priest to come with him to watch sunset at the stop at the top of the M Street steps, where once Karis met God in this sight. Long ago, like a lover forsaken, he still kept the rendezvous. Interesting. So at the top of these infamous stairs, Karis had a spiritual experience where he believed believes that he met god and now he goes back there all the time you know he's like why have you forsaken me i don't feel your presence anymore what's happened but he still shows up hoping hoping that he will find god yet again um so while this is going on kinderman goes and he finds that the paint from reagan's statue that he scraped off matches the paint from the desecrated statue desecrated mary statue there's a paint match that's not good and carl shady carl emerges from a slum racked with tears at a bus stop what's going on with carl we'll find out in our, maybe in our next in our next section but let's go to chapter six things are getting worse with reagan there's less and less lucid moments for her there's tube feedings now there's there's restraining straps the doctors are advising Chris to put her into an asylum. Chris won't do it. Uh, she finds a crucifix under her pillow at one point, and no one in the, co the house cops to it being put there. Carl, Willie, Sharon are all like, I don't look at me. I didn't fucking do it, you know? So where the fuck did this crucifix come from? Why is it under the pillow? Doc, uh, the doctors keep asking Chris if Reagan is religious at all, and how is there any way she could know about possession? Um, maybe this is a possession syndrome. Maybe we're out of answers. Maybe if, she, if this girl believes in God and believes in demons and the devil, maybe she believes she's possessed. And maybe that same belief, if she had an exorcism from a Catholic priest, maybe that could fix it. Cause we don't know what the fuck is going on. Um, and so Chris is like, well, I, she's not religious. I don't know how she would know about it. But later on, she's walking around. She sees that book on witchcraft. She sees it uh, on the bottom shelf. And there's a chapter in it all about fucking possession. And she finds out later that Willie put it there. She's asking everyone, well, did you put this book here? Where, where, where's this book been? You know, and Willie says, well, I put it there. Where did you find it? Well, I found it in the bedroom. Well, which bedroom did you find it in? reagan's bedroom 
you know? So it's like, oh, there's that seed of doubt, you know? Is this real or did Reagan read about this? And like, she's just acting out. Who knows? But she, Chris starts reading the book. Everything's lining up with the possession chapters, uh, talking about how possession and exorcism predate Christ to the earliest civilizations where Pazuzu, in fact, hails from. Kinderman shows back up and sees her reading the witchcraft book, you know, and he's already like on that witch shit. He's like, oh, fuck, what's going on here? Uh, I was like, oh, what are you reading this for? You know, she's like, oh, nothing, whatever, it's fine. He sets a timeline straight with Sharon and Chris. You know, he's like, well, when exactly did you get back? When exactly were you here? When exactly were you here? Like, what happened here? Burke Dennings, did he go to, did he go to bars on M Street? No. Okay. Well, did Burke Dennings always get a cab when he left here? Yes. Well, why the fuck didn't he get a cab then? Why would he be headed down the stairs? There's no calls from this house to any cab company. Uh, so that's pretty fucking weird. And he thinks that Burke was killed by a large man, possibly Carl, uh, and pushed from Reagan's window. He also mentions the ritual murder by so-called demons, how the heads turned around. Chris is sitting there, like, just reading about all this and is like, fuck did my daughter kill fucking burke deadings holy shit i oh this is not good this is not fucking good uh before he leaves kinderman has a word with carl at the door reads him his rights he's like fucking taping him he calls him on his bullshit on his story about being at the movies he's like you weren't at the movies you do you remember there was an altercation what happened oh that's fake hey did, did the fucking thing break down no? Oh, well, it did break down. So what the fuck? You know, this bus driver, this didn't get here till this time. So that doesn't make sense. So I need you to explain to me where the fuck you actually were, dude. You know, like, where the fuck were you? Carl will not give him the information. Uh, Kinderman even, like, turns off his thing and he's like, hey, like, if you have a, if you're like, I got a side piece, if you got a mistress, like, I won't, I won't tell your wife, okay? Just tell me so I can go corroborate this and get you off the hook here. And Carl refuses. He's like, nope, I'm sticking to my story. I was at the fucking movies. And while this is going on, uh, Chris is looking through a book and she discovers when she's looking through that witchcraft book, which was found in Reagan's room, a piece of it had been shaved off one of the pages. And that's Burke Denning's thing. You know, he shaves off pieces of pages and then like fucking eats them. And so... Burke Dennings absolutely had his hands on this book, he, which was found in Reagan's bedroom. Uh, and also she remembers, oh, fuck, when I got home, Reagan's window was open. Like, oh, my fucking guy. It's all coming together for Chris here. Then all of a sudden she hears some shit going up down upstairs. Uh, she goes up there. And now, again, Kinderman's like, oh, I think it was a man that did this, someone who had to have a lot of strength. Uh, like, please ask your daughter, does she remember anything? Whatever. She goes upstairs. Carl has been fucking knocked unconscious by Reagan. So we have a grown man, Carl, who's been knocked unconscious by this little girl. So she's displaying strength that's unusual. And then we get into some real fucked up shit. So Chris watches the demon and Reagan fighting with each other, face turning and going back and forth. And the, she's got a crucifix aimed at her vagina. And, uh, and the demon wants her to fucking stick it in. And she's like, no, no, no. And he's like, I'll fucking kill you, Sal. I'll fucking kill you. And so she's like, okay, fine. And the demon takes over. She starts roughly masturbating with the crucifix. Chris tries to stop it. Ends up getting fucking snatched. Face fucking put in the bloody vagina. Like saying, lick me. Gets hit across the fucking bedroom. Uh, she fucking continues to masturbate with this fucking crucifix. And during this, you know, Chris looks up at her and sees her head turn around and Burke Denning's eyes, you know, like it's and then says uh, to Chris, do you know what she did, your cunting daughter? And so now Chris knows Reagan killed Burke. Reagan killed Burke, guys. It's fucked up. Reagan killed fucking Burke. It's over. Oh my god, this has gotten real bad. This is now we got the fucking cops involved. This is getting really shitty. Really fucking bad. Oh, and that is the end of part two, the edge of Exorcist Club. Thank you, Mangle, for subscribing. Uh, we appreciate you. Yes, that filthy that filthy mouth. Yeah, cunting is back. 
need to use that. I want to use that on somebody. I want to use that on somebody. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, she said the C word. Yes. Yes. I remember personally when I was younger, I, I was very offended by the word cunt, but now I, I love it. I use it all the time. Uh, I use it all the time. <laughs> but for next week, uh, you need to read the third section. Let's see what the, let me see what the name of the third section is here. Uh, let's see here. The Abyss. And there's two chapters within the abyss, chapter one and chapter two. So you need to read those for our next Sunday situation. You like all my notes here? This isn't my book. This is Josh's book. I'm borrowing Josh's book and I don't want to write notes within the book. So I've been using my Chome sticky notes, which are now on sale. You can buy them separately on uh, danicaxix.bigcartel.com. <laughs> but uh, a little shameless plug there. A little shameless plug there. So we're going in. We're on the edge. Now we've gone over the edge. We're going into the abyss for next Sunday. Thank you all for joining me for Exorcist Club. Father Dan for Exorcist Club. I appreciate you. Spooky seasons. Fucking great time. We are going to take a quick break. And we will be right back. And we'll take some questions from you lovely children on the Twitch chat. All right. Well, I'll be, uh, be right back. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. 19 Academy thanks these lovely people for all their generosity and support on patreon.com slash Danica XIX. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like this video, ring the bell, and tell your friends. You can join me live on twitch.tv slash Danica XIX and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Danica XIX. Support for 19 Academy comes from viewers like you on patreon.com slash Danica XIX.